everybody. Welcome to yet another episode of Nadi Digital Economy in Malaysia. And we're going to get right, uh, right into it uh, together with my colleague Zofa Sri. Uh, we're going to start with how the world of uh, digital is, is now uh, getting into the world of agriculture. And it has already been, right? Uh, but this, this now, next story shows that we're going, moving to the next level. And this is simply where MDAC has partnered with the Bank from Bangunan Malaysia, which uh, means, means the Development Bank of Malaysia to allocate 10 million ringgit, 2.4 million US dollars uh, for, a, for a digital ag tech program. And this is targeting uh, a smart fertigation. And the smart mm. fertigation is simply where uh, the fertilizer is uh, distributed to the, the crops uh, by, by way of, of the irrigation system and not the farmer going out and spraying it and, and doing whatnot, right? Supposed to be much yes. more efficient. And so look, it's 10 million ringgit going into this space. And they've also partnered with a, a, a P2P platform, financial platform called MicroLeap. So uh, Danny, who's the, the CEO of MicroLeap, is ecstatic about being chosen. And it's all good. And I, I'm looking forward to seeing the farmers now, right, being more productive around using, you know, uh, uh, this, uh, getting the, the, some money from this, right, and uh, rolling out smart fertigation. And hopefully then yes. that is the doorway for them to realize that they can start doing more things digitally. So, which I suspect is the real intention of MDEC as well. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, my take on this, of course, is this has been a long time coming. I mean, the mm -hmm. fact the incorporation of digital technology into farming uh, practices. I, I've I've uh, I've been looking on and off into what agriculture in Malaysia has been like for okay. a while, and the truth is that the truth is that we are. I think we were really behind, to be honest. We we could we could push forward much better. Um, I mean, the the thing is, Karam. It says even says here in the press release, like it will improve farmers' income by thirty three percent. If that's true, surely every farmer yeah. will want to get on board, right? And if you that's true, so. then ten million ringgit is just not enough, right? I mean, you would think that you need more. You know, you need more, but. I guess the problem is that not everyone jumps on board straight away. I mean, Karam, you felt that you need to show yeah. to show the benefit, right, for them to come on. Yeah, because they the, already did a pilot in Kuala Langat, and I think we've spoken about this before. Uh, but, mm -hmm. it, but the fact is that a pilot, small amount of money right here, you've got 10 million ringgit. And then, by mm -hmm. the way, also CIMB Bank has already come up with a, uh, with a special program also working with MDAC. Right? And I think there was X amount of dollars there also before. So you're just seeing this pick up momentum and and you know, MDEC has had this program, uh, you know, for, for quite a few years, but it only mm. picked up steam, steam when the previous chairman, uh, uh, Dr. Rice Hussein, uh, came in, and he liked it. And he worked behind the scenes to get uh, you know the banks on board also. So now that mm. you have seen it to work, and I think the take up there has been very good. Now you you've got the next stage of this. You probably see in the future maybe they won't even wait every year. You'll see more money going into this, right? And farmers realizing that. Hey, this is great, right? And then when you start using more technology, you obviously get a younger set of more better educated people coming into farming, which has already begun to, the trickle has already begun to happen. This is hoping the trickle becomes a steady stream. It's not going to be a floodgate by any means now, but you want to see a steady stream of, of your people coming in. And farming is a strategic, you know, national security issue in Malaysia, correct? Yes. You want to see oh, well, more, food security more is, uh... farming produce coming up. So... This is a good thing, right? And and MBEC is leading this, so let, let's see more of this happening. So that's I uh, you know it's all good here, and we'll keep track of this. Maybe after six months, right? Let's do an update story on how this has gone. Uh, and meantime, now uh, let's talk about you know how also is making uh, Bank Negara uh, another government agency, right? I, I do you say Bank Negara is an agency? It is right. Uh, is now trying it's to a central bank. Uh, it's central <laughs> bank, yeah. So, it's, it's, it's the agency, right? You could say, right? In any country, the central bank yes. is the agency. Wants to make sure that it is uh, uh, the world of digital, you know, uh, uh, nicely comes in and dovetails and, and you know, seamlessly integrates with the world, traditional world of, of, of finance and money. So I'll let you take this now. So. Yeah, so this was a press release by Bank Negara Malaysia where they announced that they're working together with Paynet on the something called Project Nexus. And Project Nexus is a project that encompasses many countries. So it involves the Monetary Authority of Singapore, Bank of Italy, um, BCS. And Bank Sing of uh, Italy? Singapore. Mama mia, I'm insisting chapel, here I come. No, no, but <laughs> the, the, the idea is that, of course, that um, 
because it, it's one thing if you if you look at something like do it now in Malaysia, mm. right? So do it now works very well at the yeah. moment. You money gets transferred very quickly. You can yeah. use a phone number to transfer money. Wonderful. You don't have to know the person's bank account. And Singapore has its own system, and uh, and presumably in Italy they have their own system. So so the problem is when you want to transfer money across borders. That's where it gets a bit tricky. And I think as we always say with these kind of stories, the the problem is not in the technology. No. <laughs> the problem is in the other aspects of it, right? Yeah. Especially, a, regulatory, yeah. especially regulatory. Especially yes, especially regulatory. So, so uh, the idea is that if, if, for example, do it now, right now, if it takes 30 seconds for money to be transferred from one person to another person. So if you deposited a thousand ringgit in my account, it would take 30 seconds for that mm. money to come across. Um, they want, as a benchmark, they want it to take 60 seconds if my bank account was wow. outside of Malaysia. So that's that's the kind of speed we're looking at, right? And uh, and and one of the things, of course, is that that this is going to be a proof of concept. So mm-hmm. they, they want to try it out to show how it's possible. And the idea being that eventually that you could send money to any bank in, in Europe that take mm-hmm. accepts euros, right? That's mm-hmm. ultimately what they're, 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 they're looking at. And they think that the results will be published by the end of 2022, but it still be a proof of concept. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the other limitations, one is, of course, that uh, it's sort of limited to how um, the uh, real-time retail payment platforms, which do it now, is an example of. Mm-hmm. Um, so whatever you can do with that, you will be able to do what you cannot, you will not be able to do. So if mm. your bank, for example, imposes a certain limit, yep. that will be the limit. You can't transfer more than that. Uh, of course, governments also impose limits about how much money you can take out of the country. Yeah. or so, so that would be another kind of uh, uh, problem. But I guess that's what these prototypes are for, what these uh, proof of concepts are for to, to shake and, the system a bit. Remember- Ooh, the man is right now, Karam. The man is Namawi. Namawi, and Namawi yes. <laughs> I'm a and, big fan. I'm a big fan of Namawi. I happen to think that he is the most creative musician in Malaysia, right? This is a country that lost our legend Sudirman too young, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think Namawi is, is the next, you know, uh, uh, a creative genius in this country. And he has come up with, and he has now, of course, in the Western world, especially in the US, right? NFT, the world of digital, right? Uh, 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 money, NFT in the form of NFT has weaved together very nicely with the world of music and art. So here, our mu- leading musician, Namawi, has also now embraced the world of NFTs and uh, he's uh, produced a song, Fragile, which is in the form of uh, uh, release it in NFT. And in three hours, it has, uh, you know, he has sold it for 4 million ringgit, 1 million US dollars. I think that's the lead. The lead is now he's a multi-millionaire because yeah. he sold NFTs. No, I mean, but hey, I should sell it. Hey, remember, he said, I love the fact that he said that, hey, I will not be selling any of my earnings uh, that come from NFTs. And I think it's because he is a pure artist, Zoff, right? And, and you know, artists know that money eventually corrupts and the money dulls your creative senses. And Namami wants his creativity, spidey, spidey sense, right? Uh, uh, tingling away at maximum velocity 24-7. That's the kind okay. of person for, that's for, a Forgive my made. cynicism, Lakara. <laughs> forgive my cynicism, right? But you're too readily to embrace this 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 yes. hungry, this hungry uh, artist, who artist, chooses, artist who chooses who chooses to remain hungry because that's how he is the most creative, right? Yes. But the truth is. And I'm hey, not saying Namawi is doing. Don't piss off a fan, okay? So. <laughs> I'm not saying Namawi is doing this, but there, there are many situations where um, someone who has people have sold. It's like if I wanted to sell NFTs, I might be thinking what I should do is I should sell my first NFT and buy it, buy it from myself, as it were, okay. right? And buy it for a good price. Yeah. And if I do so, then maybe it'll make the news, and maybe people think, hey, Zoff has something worth selling, right? So the next time he sells NFTs, we're going to pay attention to what yeah. he's selling, and, and, and then, you know, it'll, it'll maybe fetch a higher price. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that's what it's doing, but because you don't know what's going on in the world of cryptocurrency, you don't know who is buying what, when, and how, um, this thing could easily happen. And, and as I said, you know, Karam, this... In the music business, right, you have record companies oh, that buy yes. their own records just mm. to push it to number one. Yeah. So, hey, hey it's not right? a new being, thing. Being, uh, being a, a DJs, right, also to, to, yeah. to play the yeah. music. Yeah. No, but look, uh, the next time, if I, I've not met Nawai before, if I do meet him, right, and if I ever do, I'm going to look him in the eye 
and I'm going to say Namawi, are you the one buying your own, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 non fungible tokens? You know, and he's going to tell me, Karam, he's going to probably pull my beard and say, how dare you question my artistic integrity? And then Zoff, when I see you, Zoff, I'm going to, I'm going to no. The and then what you're going to do is say, well, don't look at me, Namawi, but look at my colleague Zoff, whose phone number is so and so, and his address is X Y Z, and you should go and and talk to him. No, and, no, I, I, and convince him of your purity as an artist. And really, I, I, uh, let, 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 let's see how this develops for that. I just love this story, and you know, it, okay. it, it, you, you you cannot fault him for wanting to tap onto a hot trend in his world, right? So let's see where where this goes. And then now another well, hot story that refuses to go cold. It's continually <laughs> hot. And, and again, as Zoff said, Karam, we must talk about this. So Zoff, you take lead with this now. It's, it's 5G in Malaysia. That's the story, right? So 5G in Malaysia, we, last week, we talked about the fact that there was this committee form and question uh, DNB's monopoly in the space, right? So, so the news this week was a Reuters story. A Reuters story that, that said that the proposed pricing by uh, DNB was too high and telcos say that they're going to be paying more for it for 5G than if they had rolled 5G on their own, which is really incredible, isn't it, yeah. Karam, if that's true? Now, of course, DNB came back and said, no, <laughs> it is not true. Our prices are low. <laughs> They're not and, too high. And they have not been set. Yeah. So coincidentally, <laughs> for those of you who follow the show, I think two weeks ago, I said that I wanted to do a story based on the Pakatan Harapan MPs also not being happy with the DNB structure. And they're feeling it's a monopoly, right? And why don't we just auction off the spectrum? I send them questions, and which, are, according to one of the people involved in sending out the press release, one of the MPs, they have now actually sent the question to some uh, some of the ministers to get further clarification before they reply to me. But the story has now taken another leap, which is just being transparent, right? Uh, when I say another leap, is that uh, the telcos have come back; they're not going to play ball with DNB on his first attempt to get them to sign commercial agreements. And I totally agree with the telcos because DNB gave them a, 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 a contract, say, sign a 10-year lease with me. And mm -hmm. to me, that is astounding. You know, for seasoned telco executives in DNB, right, to put forward such a term to the telcos, it is incredible. It's very naive of them to do that. And I, I'm thinking the only reason why they did that is that they want these 10-year uh, contracts locked in. They will take this contract to the banks and say, look, I've got four 10-year contracts with the big four players in Malaysia. You are assured of, of payment. Now give us our multi-billion ringgit loan, right, at very good rates. It feels like that's the motivation for them to do that. And I'm glad that Telcos pushed back and said, no, we're not playing ball. And I actually, uh, and now apparently a, a DNB has gone and given them a five-year wholesale lease agreement. Can we talk about five years time if you don't like 10 years? And even mm -hmm. five years to me is too long. Unless the five year is with the caveat that every two years or 18 months, we will renegotiate the pricing because, you know, no, in no way in the world when you offer a digital service, has the cost of delivering that service gone up. The cost keeps coming down. And that's what the telcos are saying. Yeah, that's true. But the cost to yeah. deliver keeps coming down. Can we renegotiate, right, the terms we are going to sign now? And they should give them that flexibility, okay? I strongly believe they, they should. Mm. So that's where we yeah. are now. And I was talking to the, I was trying to talk to the CEO, one of the top telcos, but one of his lieutenants then spoke to me and said, Karam, uh, and he's the one who told me, hey, this 10 year thing doesn't make sense, right? And also he feels that it's unfair that the telcos are being painted as, uh, you know, don't, they don't want DNB to succeed. He said, give us a, a deal that we can work with, right? That's winning for us, that we can take back to our shareholders. And many of the shareholders in, in Exacta, in uh, Maxis and, and DG, are listed uh, are, are also listed entities and many of them are also government you know uh, funds right and maybe not government funds but but uh, private funds right in Malaysia your likes of PNB and all that so you see, we have to answer to them how can we go to them with a 10 year deal where we are locking in the pricing for 10 years now so now the terms are going to be better but I think both parties will have to work out a, a mutually a win win situation because the government promised that with this network right the way we're doing it the telcos will operate or enjoy lower operating costs. And as a country, yes. then we can roll up faster. And we are rolling up faster and we will be able to invest to make sure that the infrastructure is based on a service, a, a, a supply-driven platform, right? Which means that we will create the supply first, the demand can come later. And they're hoping yeah. that demand will come eventually. But the telcos will only take up uh, you know, wholesale capacity when they see the demand there. 
but the, the government is saying that we'll create the supply first. So that's it's what very chicken and egg, la, Karam. Sorry, it's very chicken and very chicken, chicken and egg, and right? Egg. Which and also, you're but right. but but I think I think in in Malaysia's case, I think the approach to me does make sense. I'm not saying it's the only approach. Mm. Uh, of course, uh, of so. course, the debate the debate is whether it's the best approach, but it makes sense because um, the telcos and you know, MCMC and the government, everyone is kind of a little in bed with each other. So actually, the thing just needs to succeed. All right. Oh, I, mean, I think it will succeed. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And also, by the way, the telco guy told me that you know the government is under pressure because it said that there will be 5G rollout in Q4, right? Q4 started yes. last month when um, we we're almost in the middle of November. But even this executive told me that we can we can come up with an interim solution where we can roll out 5G and give the government the win that it that it wants to show the country, right? So he said mm -hmm. they do that, but in the meantime, let's work out this long-term uh, problems, right? And where you're trying to force the short-term solution to long-term problem. And the short-term solution he's talking about is where they're making them sign a long-term contract and they're saying that we're going to use this, our 5G you know, infrastructure, single operator you know, model uh, to roll, roll this out. But I think well, uh, I, I support the single operator model. But I think DNB has just got to be practical, right? And just create a win-win solution for both, especially for the operators. Because they're the ones who are going to deliver the service, not DNB, right? DNB just providing the whole system. Yeah. Hey, the highway is ready. Please mm. now come and lease chunks of it to roll out to Karamjit, to Zor, to all, you know, those who are listening to, to, you know, uh, to, to this show. And let, let's get it working. Right? Let's get the innovation pipeline and, and your wheelbarrow you know, cranking in Malaysia. Because 5G is yeah. supposed to unleash the next wave of your innovation. I mean, I'll have to borrow someone's phone to try it out once it comes out because I don't have a 5G phone yet. But it, it'll get there, you know, like, like the whole network. Right. It'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's um, move on just to, to our final two stories which you found was yeah. very interesting. Just, quick take just, to, just, to, yeah, just to wrap up. So one was the story that MyEG is working on automated driver uh, driving license tests. Uh, basically, there is going to be a proof, another proof of concept, <laughs> a proof of concept where uh, people, uh, where driving tests will now be conducted without the need of a human being evaluating the test, right? So, so the idea is that th this automated system will look at the the people taking the test as they drive electronically and then uh, generate results computer-wise, right? So it, it's it's like on the one hand, from the technology, it sounds really cool, but like I think you you'll you'll sympathize that the the idea was first proposed to minimize human interaction to prevent these so-called mm. copio licenses, huh, Karam, which yeah. you you yourself have Rail had first against, hand right? yeah. I'm I'm super <laughs> annoyed by this because my 18-year-old son told me that he's going for his test, said he got two 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 pricing uh, from the driving school, right? One where you're getting to, to pass, the other one where you may not pass. And this really drives me crazy. And it infuriates me that, you know, three decades after the likes of you and me or more, right? Took our driving mm. test where you were given this option also. No, I didn't get Wait, Can we just, can we just like, I got my driving license fair and square. I just want to say there was no. Wonderful. So, but I, I suspect <laughs> the system is just, you know, a, a lot of people are not getting it. I mean, they've been given the option, right? And it's okay. being made. And I, I really hope my EG succeeds with this so that we can just cut this BS out of this, you know. Uh, driving school license scam, which to me is a scam because he, you, a lot of RTD, you know, road transport department officials may not even be involved. Is the driving schools who are who are uh, yeah. paying on on your fear, right, and saying, yeah, for sure, it's, it's the system is corrupt. Or okay, I just pay extra hundred ringgit or two hundred ringgit and get my driving license instead of the hassle of going through it again. So for, just, for all you know, for all you know, they're, they're, they're getting the extra money and they're not doing anything with it. They're just keeping yeah, it. So and I, I hope if, income if you, tax department audits all these driving school owners. Uh, and by the way, uh, <laughs> income tax, you know, freaked me out on, on my birthday, right? At 1.15 a.m. in the morning, they sent me an email wishing me a happy birthday. Thank you very happy much. Birthday, please, don't do that. please don't do that in future. Okay, I find that very chilling when the tax man remembers your birthday and he's the first one to wish you a happy birthday, right? <laughs> Fine. And the last story um, is another, what I thought, another fun story. Pharma Nyaga, the pharmacy company, they are testing out this thing called Project Eagle, which is a drone that will fly, fly medicine from, from their supply to, to whichever clinic or hospital that needs it. And Project Eagle, they tried it out at Pankor and they flew three kilos of medicine oh. across the water. 4.2 kilometers, they said. It took 
it normally takes them 30 minutes if they want to deliver by boat. With this drone, it took them three and a half minutes. And, and much that's smaller carbon fantastic. footprint also. Imagine the petrol, the diesel use, right? Versus this, uh, fantastic. Mm. And, and of course, they, are, they have an eye on using these drones in Sabah and Sarawak remote areas where, where it's hard to get to. And I think, I mean, this is a great example of, uh, I mean, a relatively accepted technology now being put to like some really, really good use, yeah. I think, that yeah. will impact uh, people at the ground level. Yeah, look forward to seeing more of this, right? So uh, these are examples where the digital economy is just coming together in Malaysia right? and the pace, I think, is picking up. And this show is all about, you know, trying to keep our our, our, our finger on the pulse of Malaysia's digital economy. Uh, with that, mm -hmm. we hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, you know, uh, uh, comment in the video and even better if you want to share it with your, with your community. That's wonderful. Uh, we're going to see you next week again with more interesting good stories. And hopefully next week, we won't have to talk about DNB, right? <laughs> no promises. We'll see no what, what the news comes up. All right. Okay.